Plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug, plug the mug. I've been asked to plug the mug tonight. <laughs> Good evening, popular astronomers. It's Vicky here with Pop Astro Live. More about this little gem later. Finally managed to wash my lipstick marks off it. Tonight, we are having a radio astronomy special. So how are you doing? This is week, God knows how many, of lockdown. It's nice to see people already joining in. Please feel free to comment, ask questions. We've got some real live astronomers coming on uh, shortly. So uh, we have got a heck of a lineup for you tonight. Now, tonight's show has been inspired by this wonderful article in our um, popular astronomy magazine, which I've just had a water spillage on. <laughs> It's actually not very absorbent, which is quite a good, quite a good thing. Uh, tonight's episode is brought to you by DIY Radio Telescopes. We are going to have Citizen Science Officer Alan Sh Alice Shepherd coming on, talking about that in a little bit. So, how are you tonight? Then life is looking well. It's good for me. Um, I am a lot browner than what I was this time last week, but not as brown as I was on. Sunday, if that makes sense. So um, tonight, it's our radio astronomy special. We've got Robin Skagil coming on um, at about five past eight. We've got Dr. Anna Bernaldi coming on from the Square Kilometre Array. And also, as I mentioned, our citizen science officer, Alice Shepard. We're going to be talking about cereal boxes. So... If you don't know what the Square Kilometre Array is, when it comes online, it's going to be pretty much the world's biggest science experiment. And it's absolutely enthralling. Now, if you thought the dish at Jodrell Bank was big, then when complete, the SKA, SKA will make Jodrell look like a soup bowl at Wembley Stadium. So first things first, this is the important thing tonight, the mug. There's somebody in the mug. There is actually somebody in the mug. And you have to guess who it is to win the mug. Now, we've just got a new range of mugs um, 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 made up with great new logos and little jokes on them. Uh, they're, they're absolutely fantastic. Paul Sutherland has been working diligently to come up with puns, and he's a retired hack, you know. So it means that he's thought of some very witty things to put on the side of the mug. You can pick which mug you want, but first, to win it, you've got to guess who's in it. Now, I can only answer yes or no questions, but hopefully by the end of the show, we can narrow it down. Let's see. Oh, hello. Um, hello to Ian Baker. As Jimmy Vicky, that's me. And hello to Paulina. Hi, Paulina. Do you fancy having a guess to see who's in the mug to win it? Just start guessing. Start narrowing it down. You know, male, female, um, astronomer, <laughs> famous person, scientist. <laughs> you know how to play the yes or no game, don't you? So great. Start guessing away. It's lovely to have you this evening. So, yeah. Um, who could be inside the mug. So something unusual is happening tonight and you're going to be really lucky if you get to see it. It's a beautiful full strawberry moon this evening. It's going to appear in the sky. It's going to coincide with a really subtle penumbral eclipse. Now, it's only going to be visible pretty much from the south of the country. I'm just looking out towards Snowdonia now and there's a really thick bank of clouds, so I'm probably not going to get to see it. Um... From Edinburgh, the moon won't rise until 21.40. The eclipse ends at 22.06. Okay, so there's going to be a slight penumbral eclipse. Um, this is the most subtle form of eclipse, and it occurs when the Earth, sun, and moon are all aligned with the Earth casting a slight shadow over the moon. Now, last year when there was a penumbral eclipse, it was amazing. It was like this black bruise on the moon, and I thought it was more exciting than almost the, than a total eclipse. Um, also tonight, it's the strawberry moon. Now, why is it called a strawberry moon? Is it because it's going to be big and pink? Well, sometimes moons are big and pink as they rise, but many of the moons have are given names due to, um, well, the Native Americans who've got beautiful, poetic names for full moons. Now, I'm one quarter Native American, and for me, that is just... Um, 
it's just such a beautiful name. So in January, you've got the wolf moon or the old moon. In February, you've got the snow moon, or it's also known as the hunger moon. I mean, that just really makes me want to cry to think that the February moon is called the hunger moon. You can imagine why. March, some beautiful romantic name for the names for the spring and summer uh, moons. In March, we've got the worm moon or the sap moon. April, it's the pink moon or the planter's moon. May is the flower moon or the budding moon. And June is the strawberry or the rose moon. There's some gorgeous roses out right now, aren't there? Absolutely beautiful. If ever I see a rose, you can guarantee I'll stick my nose in it. Always stop and smell the roses. Um, July is the book moon or the thunder moon. August, sturgeon or green corn moon. September, the well-known famous harvest moon or the corn moon. And October, oh, start to get depressing and wintry again. Brr, the hunter's moon or the moon of falling leaves. November, beaver moon and frost moon. And December is the cold moon and the long night moon. So let us rejoice. Tonight is the strawberry moon. And even if you don't get to see the penumbral eclipse, which I'll be very impressed if you do, you might get to see a beautiful full moon rising above the lands, casting shadows. And I love actually trying to um, read um, by the full moon. It's um, obviously not something I do for a particularly long time, but it is interesting just to see if the moon is bright enough to um, cast, shadow, uh, cast a light bright enough to read. And you can always read our wonderful magazine, which is out every two months. Robin, we're coming to you. Are you ready? <laughs> Here we come. Hi there. Hey, Hi there. Robin. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, sorry, Hello. I got a blue. I don't yeah, know why. Yeah, you so. are coming through. <laughs> you are nice blue. Moon blue. Tonight. That doesn't look. <laughs> Robin, it's really good to see you, as it always is on on these broadcasts. My, you are blue. <laughs> Let's see if I can put a bit of light on this. It's the uh, maybe it's my red shirt that's turning everything down. I don't know why. <laughs> are you it's wearing one of those? Auto um... color balance for you. It doesn't work very well, does it? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> you look like a Smurf. <laughs> Thank you very much. Astronomer Smith. <laughs> so how are you, Robin? What have you been up to and what wonderful news have you got for us tonight? Well, actually, in, in a way, it's wonderful news. You've already mentioned the penumbral eclipse of the moon, which a few of us will be able to see. Don't expect a great spectacle. As you said, it's uh, great. it's going to be pretty well over by the time we, uh, we get it. And the moon will be rising from the London area about five past nine. Uh, from where you are, I think it's, uh, I wrote it down, yes, I did know, is 21, 27, that's near it I can get. And um, so by the time the moon has risen, you might just see a faint dusky shading bit to the to the bottom left of it, uh, bottom right of it. And that will be it, the partial eclipse of the moon, uh, or the mm -hmm. number of eclipse of the moon. Don't expect great spectacle. But if you are if you are interested in seeing the Starlink satellites, the procession of Starlink satellites, those will be coming over tonight, visible from most of the country, They're particularly uh, high up in the south. At about 23.48, they will be overhead, or pretty well overhead, going through the plough. And uh, wow. that, that, that's, that's from, you, uh, from the London, London area. A bit further north, they will be a bit lower in the sky, lower down to the south. And even from the north of Scotland, up in Thurso, you'll be able to see them very low on the, on the southern horizon. 2348, they're supposed to be about magnitude uh, 1.5. Oh. Uh, sometimes there's brightness varies. It is a spectacular sight, but as we know, the Starlink satellites are the bane of astronomers these days mm. because there are getting to be so many of them. There's a, there's a launch of 60 about every month, and the plan is to put 12,000 of them up with Elon Musk's constellation of satellites, and there are others planned as well. So at this, in, this time of year in particular, satellites are very prominent in the sky because the sun is so low below the, uh, the, the horizon, virtually the northern horizon, so the satellites are all illuminated, and you just get dozens of them this time of year. Um, can I just say what I tend to do, because it's really easy to miss a space station or satellite pass, set the reminder in your phone for about two minutes before it's due. And then when it beeps, you can just dash out, throw your coat on and um, and wow, wonderful. And that's going to be a good high pass at about what time? 12, 11, 48 uh, eleven forty eight BST. And they should be in a very narrow procession because they, they only launched yesterday. And oh, so, so they will be gonna... clapped together. So it will look like a string of pearls going through the sky. Not great fun for astronomers, particularly if you're trying to take a photograph of the sky at that time of the of night, but actually a spectacular sight. I've seen them from other parts of the world, 
and it was a dramatic sight. So hopefully they will be to your liking, but uh, let's hope that they uh, don't spread all over the sky too much. Otherwise, it could be very difficult to, for astrophotographers and astronomers. Well, uh, hopefully he's going to have, uh, get them tilting flat side on and, and all sorts of cover up stealth mode, um, painting them black. Is that right? Yeah, painting them black apparently didn't work. The, the, the latest batch is one of them that has got a sun visor on it okay. and it shields it from the sun. So the, the sun okay. uh, will not shine, reflect so much so brightly off that particular satellite. I don't know which one it is in the series, but maybe one of them will look a bit darker. Let's hope so. So fingers crossed there. Robin, um, can you talk to us? First of all, now, I, I've, where's my magazine gone? It's here. We need a shout out. I think we need to keep plugging this because I know you ran off your feet doing lots of other stuff for the um, um, the SPA. We need an editor for this. And it's a voluntary role. But wow, it's going to look good on your CV, isn't it? That's right. Yes, I'm doing it at the moment. I'm, I, I'm quite happy to carry on. It's an interesting job. And it's a very... Um, it's a very time-consuming job, uh, not not all the time. I mean, it's a part-time uh, effort, but we have been doing this for the last 60 years, producing a, a magazine, and it is a wonderful magazine. It is amazing how much people can do voluntary, and it is a professional standard. It's a, a world-class magazine, really, it's and it's something we do voluntarily, and yet the contents are really good, and I will pit them against anybody else. Don't... Uh, it's it's not an amateur production in many ways yes it is completely not and um I, my fa i know we always talk about this but i do love the section reports that we have where you can contribute your own observations this magazine comes every two months um as part of your spa membership so yeah uh, who, what have we got in the uh, we've got section reports deep sky reports variable star solar and i think the great thing about this magazine is it really allows you to focus in on your particular niche of astronomy and to contact and get in touch with other people who've got the same passion for you yes yeah, so this issue for example we've got all the one that's uh, that you've got there we've got a profile of the deep sky photographer stephen norrie who's up in scotland showing all the equipment he's got and how he goes about taking his deep sky photographs which are superb and in the next issue which i've been working on we've got a, another profile and then the september one yet another one looking at amateur astronomers, some of our members, showing you how they go about taking their photographs. So that's something that you uh, that you really got to look at if you're interested in taking pictures of those galaxies and nebulae up in the sky. So, Robin, would you like to take your first guess of who's in the mug? <laughs> <laughs> Male or female? Oh, um, so I, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to guess. What, what, what was the question again? Okay, now me. there's someone, there's a photograph of somebody in the mug. And because we've got some new mugs, which you can see on the SPA website, yep. this is a chance to win one of the mugs. Uh, uh, your your um, employees uh, are, are exempt from winning, but at least you can start off the guessing game. Right. So I've got to guess somebody who is in the mug. Male yes or, or no. It's a yes or no question. You know, 20 questions, oh. but I'm sure it'll rattle on for many more. Oh, than oh I see. Okay. Is it male or female? Yes, that's a, that's a good one. Hang on. <laughs> I can only answer yes or no. I'm going to stick to my own rules. <laughs> right. Is it male? Yes. No. Right. There we go. That's, You've had that's a guess. A good well done. I, I'm with it now. Sorry. I missed, the, I missed the preamble. I was trying to log in. We've um, we've narrowed it down to 51% of the population. The the person in the mug is female. Oh, so Alan Clitheroe is saying, um, is it 2348 UT or local time, Robin? That's BST. Um, and too. yeah, and I looked across the if you look on heavens above, that's heavens hyphen above dot com. You can get predictions from where you live. And uh, I checked across most of the UK and it seemed to be pretty well um, at the, the same time wherever you are, because they're going across the south. Um, and they're going more or less across the UK. So it's pretty well the same time wherever you are. Twenty three forty eight BST. Twelve minutes to twelve. If you want it the other way. Now we've got your friend Paulina on. Hi, Paulina. Hello. She's one Hugs. of the regulars at the meetings. Yep. Always there. Lovely to see her there. Okay. So Paulina is guessing maybe Brian Cox, because uh, uh, he's not a lady. Um, so um, it is a female. Um, that's all the, the only clue you've got so far. Um, Robin. Yes. Now, 
tell us, I've got on your little bio here that you're a glowworm aficionado. That's right. Well about done, it, please. And glowworms are around at this time of year. We've started to get reports of them. You know, it's it's something that just intrigued me about 30 years ago. I saw uh, my first glowworms and I thought, why don't why don't I know more about these? But they're lovely things. I, people sometimes call them earth stars because at this time earth of stars. year when oh. the, the skies are light, you can actually look down on the ground and see little green stars glowing up at you. And most people don't realise that there are glowworms near them. And most, most counties have got them all over the place. But Really? Be, oh, yes. Yeah. As I found out, there are some within a couple of miles of where you are at the moment, which you didn't know about. And, yeah. Um, so I run the UK Glowworm Survey. That's one of the reasons I'm so busy with things. And uh, I get reports. We, we got, we're getting dozens of reports in all the time now, um, just telling us where people have seen glowworms. If you want to know more, the website is glowworms.org.uk. And you can go there and find out all about glowworms. And you can uh, check on the, the, the blog that I do where people are seeing them now this evening and um hopefully you will be able to go out and find some if you live in a town you have to get out into the countryside where they are but most people can find them fairly close to where they live within within uh, 10 or 20 miles anyway you won't necessarily find them in your backyard but uh, oh. who knows you might find them if you haven't looked for them how i mean i'm quite into my natural history and these glowworms have just passed me by so are they on the ground or in the trees yes. or yes you will see them on the ground if you see them in trees they're almost certainly laser lights but uh, which we get around <laughs> christmas and i get reports around december saying saying oh we've got 100 glowworms in the tree next door and i said no sorry <laughs> those are laser lights and you get some very attractive laser decorations these days which look very pretty but they're not glowworms. Not glowworms. glowworms usually not in huge numbers they're usually in twos and threes sometimes you may get uh, about 10 or 20 in a small area and they are they glow naturally they're little beetles the females glow to attract the males the if you like it's a bit like um the young people going to what we used to call a dance i don't know what they call it these days and Raven. Uh, the, yeah <laughs> And all the ladies put on their finest clothes and they shine away and the scruffy little males turn up and uh, try and nab them. And that's why the, uh, that's how the glowworms get it together. And the great thing is you get tiny little beetles. Now you go on a landscape at night and you, you don't see anything around. And then this little beetle, you can see it from 50 yards away, tiny little beetle, just about an inch long, shining away, trying to attack the male glowworms and which are the ones that fly the female just sit on the ground and glow and that's how they get it together and it's it's a wonderful sight on the summer's evening go out looking for them please ah so uh, that's so wonderful right we've all got to go on a mission while we're looking at strawberry moons and are they like um glow up um paint like alarm clocks like they charge up in the sun <laughs> No, they're 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 more like the glow sticks which you buy in fairgrounds. You know, you you break yeah. the stick and chemicals, and so they mix two chemicals and uh, they glow completely cold light. It's a very efficient light, the glowworms light, and they're called Lampyris noctiluca, the the Latin name, and uh, they, they means uh, night shining noctiluca, and that's what they are. Only see them in june and july and sometimes into august so oh my gosh so it's pink that. glowworm sister season right now then yeah and are and they like them on the, the great orm in clandidno so Ooh. they're not far from you and you'll probably find them near you as well so go and look that's a really nice tip actually robin and do they i know some of them like glow with certain flash patterns do they do that per species no they're or? continuous glow uh, oh. apart from the larvae which do flash on and off and People sometimes say that, uh, in fact, I had to correct the great Chris Packham on this, who was doing yes, a TV the broadcast. Uh, yeah. he, he wanted me, uh, he, I helped him find some glowworms a, a number of years ago. And he said, did you know that they will turn off when you, you approach them? And I said, well, actually, they don't. And the, the reason it looks as if they turn off is sometimes what they do is twist their tails like that oh. to, so as to become more evident. Now, a pop music quiz they, she danced like a glowworm. Uh, she, she wriggles like a glowworm. Who said that? What line is that? Chuck Berry. Roll over oh. Beethoven. She wriggles <laughs> like a glowworm. And that he knew what glowworms looked like. They, their tails, they swish them around like that so that they, if there's a grass dam in the way, they can still be seen. And so you, you, you've got a, a pop music connection there with glowworms. 
Oh, Robin, that's really wonderful. Thank you so much. And just uh, speaking of noctilucent and night shining, have you seen any noctilucent clouds um, this season? I haven't, but I know they have been seen uh, in fairly small numbers. I know Stu Atkinson saw them up in uh, in Carlisle, uh, in Kendall, rather, uh, 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 a couple of nights ago. Not all that bright, but they have been seen. And now's the time to start looking for them. My northern horizon is appalling. Most of my horizons are appalling around here. There's trees in the way. But I know if you can look over to the north tonight, we may be lucky to see these noctilucent clouds. They look like cirrus clouds. They're shining very low on the northern horizon. Uh, but they're beautiful bluish clouds, uh, very uh, like cirrus, but wreaths of, um, of of light, and um, they are very much higher than ordinary cirrus clouds. Usually about eleven o'clock, half past eleven at night. If you see them at uh, half past ten or something like that, that's just ordinary cirrus, just in the sun in the high sun, but uh, it, in the uh, higher high above the the earth. But the noctilucent clouds are a special kind of thing. Wow. Okay, Robin, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to chat to you and um, definitely see you next week. And you're not looking quite as blue now. The life has come back to your face. You've obviously got yeah. some oxygen back in your system. That's right. Uh, okay. Great um, to see you. Catherine Rainer Evans says, Howdy ho. Oh, hi, Kat. There we go. I've not, I have oh, yet to meet this lovely lady. Yep. Great. No, okay, well. we're going to. She, right then. She helps me with popular astronomy. She's the features editor of popular astronomy. So uh, she's very helpful indeed. And she personally licks all the stamps for every envelope because <laughs> I know she's mad <laughs> about stamps. <laughs> okay, quite. excellent. Oh, so, um, oh, Andy Smith is saying I captured them last weekend. I'm assuming he means glow, uh, not, not to loosen clouds and not glow worms. <laughs> yes, leave the glow worms where they are. Yeah. Oh, I did catch a firefly once on holiday and it went out. Well, as, you you would, as you would if I grabbed you in your hand, in, in, in my hand, you would just extinguish. So catch you later, Robin. Um, thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. I think you just need to press the off button somewhere there, Robin. Do I have an off button? I don't know how Please to do you. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Right then. I need a drum roll. I need a drum roll. Um, let's just go here. Oh, first of all. Okay. We have got Best Who's in the Mug. You can win one of our new SPA mugs. Just keep on guessing. Just keep throwing random female names out there, please. I might give you a little clue in a minute. So far, we have had um, Maggie. It's not Maggie. It's not Jocelyn Bell Burnell. I got to interview her um, this time last year at the official inauguration of the Square Comet Array where I was making videos. She was ultra cool. And um, wow. Yes. So let me have a think now. So I was doing a video blogging commission at the Square Comet Array headquarters in at Jodrell Bank. And they presented her with this big metal key, big hexagonal key. And the key looked was actually made from the panels of the Mark I dish. So it was like a big kind of, it looked like aluminium. And along the, I don't know what the point, the stem of a key is called, but it's actually had the signature of the first pulsar that she discovered. And it was 21 centimetres long, which is the signature of the wavelength of hydrogen. And you know, I might be getting slightly out, of my, slightly out of my depth with this. So let's speak to someone who probably knows about this kind of thing. We are going to go over to a lady who I've known on Twitter for nearly 10 years and known very actively on Facebook for all this time. And yet, I don't know even what she sounds like. We've never communicated other than with messaging. It's Alice Shepherd. Alice, hello. hello. Well, I'm, it's I'm the first time. It is, yeah. Well, as to what I sound like, I was teased at school for being too posh and at university for not being posh enough. Oh, okay. So quite in the middle then. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I hope so. How are you? Oh, my gosh, Alice. It's so nice to hear from you. Just move your um thingy down so we can get your face in a little bit, my darling. Oh, That's so it. That. Yeah, I'm afraid my laptop camera seems to do this massive zoom. So you normally get just my forehead. <laughs> no finer thing to film than a lady's forehead. How are you, Alice, anyway? <laughs> yeah, fine. I've already done one talk today, so I'm in a very chatty mood. Oh, that's really good. Yes. So, um, 
Now, the thing that inspired me to get you on is that you wrote this fantastic article. You are the citizen science article uh, officer for the SPA. Tell yep. us a little bit more about that first, and then we'll talk about your amazing cardboard article. Oh, I love cardboard. Yeah, citizen science officer for the SPA it means that if anyone has queries about citizen science, then I I try to answer them. I think that there is one person who I should have answered a very long time ago. He wrote to me about meteorites, and I actually don't know. And I, I was terribly busy at the time. So if you're if you're listening in, sir, then I'm very sorry, and I will answer you one day. <laughs> Most people I do is write a monthly column on, on citizen science. It has been several years now, but there are actually enough citizen science astronomy projects in the world for me to still carry on writing one six times a year. So it must be well over 20 by now. Right. OK. What's your favourite? What, what's one of your most favourite ones then? Favouritist. <sighs> That's far too difficult. I, I know that the generally one of the favourites has been this one. It certainly generated one of the biggest responses. And another of the big popular ones was when I interviewed Julia Wilkinson, who was at Galaxy Zoo with me. We talked about all the citizen science work she'd been doing, lots of tracking ships' logs to look at historical aurora data, things like that. And someone wrote to me after that to say, I want to do what Julia does. How do I do it? That was lovely. Oh yeah, because the um so the, some of the ones on Galaxy is it, it's called Galaxy Zoo, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, the, the ships almanac ones where they 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 um read the ships logs and um work out yeah, what the weather no. was. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, those those might be called old weather. I can't actually remember the name of the one where they were looking at historical aurora data from ships. So I, I don't know if that project is still running. They come and go. So sorry about that. But hey, if I find out, then we'll paste a link in Facebook, won't we? Sure, Alice. Tell us um, about how people can get involved if they just want to do a little bit of spur of the moment citizen science right now. Give us a couple of the best um, links that they can follow. Well, obviously, my favourite, www.galaxyzoo.org. If you want any project like Galaxy Zoo, then look at Zooniverse. Just Google Zooniverse. You will find it. But it is Zooniverse.org if you like to be precise. Um, Those are wonderfully yeah. simple. You you basically get a picture, maybe two pictures. You you get a galaxy or a muon or whatever's going on that they want you to check out, and they'll say, "What's happening in here?" They'll ask you what features to look for, and you'll identify them. And the reason they can't do it for themselves is because there are so blooming many. It's wonderful mm -hmm. contributing to that. Okay, excellent. So now you, I was reading this over breakfast yesterday, and it's yes. one of your beautifully written articles. Uh, what, tell us a little bit more about what's what's happening here, please, Alice. Oh, gosh. Well, I, I wish that I was an expert. I'm no expert on the practical stuff, I'm afraid, and I haven't tried it myself. I've had so many emails saying, hey, exactly how do I build one? We hoped that it would be out by now, the exact method, but because of COVID, they've had to sort of oh. put it on hold for a little while. But as soon as the exact instructions come out, then we will tell you all, I promise. You so can it's also a DIY radio, DIY radio telescope. How cool is that? I know. I, I love how cool the, the idea is that you can just make it out of random objects. As long as you've got some kind of tall, skinny pyramid shaped thing of upside down, kind of this this shape, just, just like the shape of the antenna that discovered the Big Bang radiation, actually. And then after that, some kind of metal box. And as long as the inside of it is all is lined with metal or foil, something shiny, it should get those radio waves. But the exact measurements, we do not know yet. They're still finalising. So in theory, dogs that have been to the vets are actually little radio telescopes. <laughs> that is a fantastic research question. Right, let's apply <laughs> the funding. Can dogs hear the CMB? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Maybe that's what they're so excited about all the time. <laughs> Lovely, lovely thought. Okay, Alice. So would you like to see if, right, well, obviously the cat is out of the bag. The astronomer is nearly out of the mug. There's a female astronomer in this mug. Who could it be? Oh, someone's guessed it. <laughs> oh, well, I love to guess. So shall I yeah, keep quiet? On, you, you can guess and see if you can. It's not Heather Cooper. Sylvia's Weir. It's not Heather Cooper, sorry. Somebody's guessed it. Go on, take another guess. I'm going to guess Cecilia Payne-Gaposchkin because she's my favourite. 
And it's just nice to say her name, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> so it is well done to, let's have a look who's got it right here. It is, oh, who's coming out? Do you know what? You know the way it's um, illegal to deface money, isn't it? Well, I've cut her picture out of the magazine and I don't know whether it's illegal to cut people's people people <laughs> out of the magazine. I have defaced the SPA magazine, but here she is. Who's coming out of the mug? Is she the right way around? There we go. Trying to create some tension. It up. Oh, there she is. Who's that? Did it. <laughs> you look like me on Zoom most of the time. <laughs> yes, it's just the forehead. Did it. Who's that? Did it. <laughs> is that Lucy Green? It is Lucy Green. Congratulations, Paul Harper. You've won one of the SPA mugs. We'll get it into the post to you ASAP. I'm assuming you can choose from one of our lovely new designs, or you might just get an old one that was in stock. I don't know. Depends how generous Paul Sutherland is feeling. <laughs> Very good. So, have you met Lucy? Yeah. Yeah, we ended up working together on a UCL event. It was great. So, Lucy is amongst many other wonderful things, is our chief stargazer, and she heads up the um, young stargazer section. Sorry, Lucy, I'll pop you back in the magazine there. She heads up the young stargazer section. This time we have got a day in the life of an astronomer visiting a 30-meter telescope. So that's really good, isn't it? Um, wow, okay, yeah. So this is kind of the center of the magazine's written in quite a kid-friendly format. If I was about 10 years old, I would have absolutely loved this. So there we go. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy. Well, Alice, I've also put on your um, bio that you are random recipe genius. Now, I do random, I do random recipes, but I am definitely not a genius because mine, everything I I cook just is like it's been catapulted out of an airplane. Whereas you really do cook some very very beautiful. But you're really like me. You will put anything in a pan. Is that true? Mm, I have limits. But I don't know, for me, cooking is, is like art. I can almost smell and taste and almost see and feel and hear all the, all the different textures and tastes. I like to sort of balance tastes. If, I, if there's something creamy on, on the one side, then I want something sharp on the other side. No, I don't really have that. I just put lots and lots of flavouring in of many descriptions. Yeah, I think maybe I should be a little bit more subtle. That's a good tip, actually. Think about balancing your flavours, Vicky. What did you have for tea tonight, Alice? I haven't had it yet, but at the moment I've got some spelt on the oven. I've only cooked with spelt once before, but what's going in it will be onions, broccoli, cherry tomatoes, a bit of garlic, maybe some balsamic vinegar or lemon juice, olive oil, spring onion, coriander. I think that's it. Well, it'll be a, a healthy but also yummy salad. And that's yeah, I do not always bother with healthy. Okay, well, spelt sounds fantastic. Well, Alice, it's been so wonderful to finally, finally connect with you properly. Oh, you too, you too yeah, Vicky. It's been a long time. I feel like we've chatted verbally many times because I, I often hear you when you write. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> we've been through quite a lot together, haven't we, Alice? We've pinged a lot of messages together over the years, oh, yeah. haven't we? <laughs> well, let's do that. Do we? We've oh, that's so nice. Yeah. I think actually that's a really nice thing about joining the SPA and getting active on the forums is because you will immediately start connecting with new friends and meeting new friends is so good for your mental health, especially in lockdown. I've had this wonderful kind of almost like a therapy relationship with you over the years, Alice, and we've really helped oh, each other and yeah. it's been really sweet. And this is just, this is why the Astro community just should really connect a lot more. So, once you join and you get access to our meetings and you start to meet amazing people like Alice, yeah, it just really helps with your well-being. And I think that's so important nowadays in lockdown, don't you think, Alice? Yeah, yeah. It, I was in my mid-20s before I met any anyone else interested in astronomy and it's just been so much nicer. We're it was quite always... an, out, an outward-looking bunch, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I like to think so. I mean, we we vary as much as anyone else do, but... Yeah, yeah excellent. meet other astronomers. Well, may you see a tiny tad of the eclipse tonight. You might get a tiny little bite taken out Ooh. of the strawberry of the moon. 
Okay, Alice. Well, um, I think you've got to sign out now. Oh, can I do yeah. this for you? Okay, I'm gonna say I'm gonna it's been a pleasure, Alice, and I'll see you soon. Yeah. You too, Becky. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that was great. I can't believe I've never even spoken to Alice or heard her voice. So thank you very much to um who won the mug? Who won the mug? Paul Harper. Lucy Green was living in the mug. This could become a weekly feature, actually. Who's in the mug? <laughs> that was second grass, Sam Sandra Grace. Hello, Sandra. Mars um, aficionado there. Paul Harper says, have interviewed her at MSSL. What's MSSL? Um, mm, don't know which one that is. Great. Okay, so um, we've got our next um, chat show guest coming up in a moment. Let's just have a quick look here. Okay. So, well, God, when was um, Blue Dot Festival? Um, the anniversary of the moon landings last year, I was like, like I'm the showbiz girl that I am. I was on BBC Breakfast very, very briefly with Macclesfield Astronomy Society on the Friday, which was the 50th anniversary of the moon landings. I had to be at Jodrell Bank at 4.30 a.m. and it was absolutely brutal. And through many circumstances and twists of fate, I actually ended up with a free ticket to Blue Dot, which is the incredible space science and music festival held at Jodrell Bank. Sadly, not going ahead this year, hopefully next year with Bjork headlining. Oh boy, did I party. I had this wristband on. I had no idea where I was going. All of my friends were in there. And Blue Dot is absolutely just one of the finest, most sleek experiences of my entire life. The talks, the dancing, the partying, the spectacles, not the glasses, the actual spectacles of things happening there. I remember they had this huge, big lantern tissue paper version of the Apollo rocket that um, with maybe about 20 people holding it up like a Chinese dragon and that kept coming through. Uh, there was craft work, there was hot chip, there was new order, all sorts of amazing bands and talks and of course it was all overshadowed by my favourite place in the universe which is the dish at Jodrell Bank. I have um got a bit of a crush on that dish actually ever since I've been a little girl and um we used to be able to see it on the Cheshire Plain and my dad used to tell me it was the moon why would you do that dad it wasn't the moon it was Jodrell Bank and I believed you <laughs> so yes that dish has been a huge part of my life growing up in Cheshire and I've had an idea actually you ever seen those weird tv programs where people marry the Eiffel Tower <laughs> I'm getting ideas in my head okay so our next guest Anna Bernaldi. So she did her degree in PhD astronomy at the University of Padova in Italy and specialised in cosmology, the study of the universe as a whole. Anna first pursued this research by joining the Planck Collaboration, an extremely successful satellite experiment that mapped the cosmic microwave background to unprecedented sensitivity. As this experiment came to an end, Anna joined the Square Kilometre Array, which is my favourite science experiment in the universe, which will be even more exciting because it will look at the universe in many different ways. So we are now going on over to Anna. Hey, Anna. Hello. Hi, good evening. Hey, whereabouts are you in the world at the minute then? Well, where I am, um, I am uh, at my home, <laughs> like I'm supposed to be, I guess. Good. I live near Manchester, South Manchester. The SKA headquarters is actually in Jodrell Bank. So this yeah. is where I used to commute to work. Uh, at the moment, we are all working from home. So, Oh, so, yeah. I, well, first of all, South Manchester, that is a cool place to live. But uh, I guess it's weird in lockdown. Whereabouts precisely are you? Uh, near where the airport is. Okay, yeah. I think I used to live in Chalton, which was a fun party time of my life. Yeah, close to that. Gatley is called. I don't know if you know it. It's I just do. a village in yeah. the airport, near the airport area, yeah. Good, so, uh, good uh, for going to Jodrell Bank. Oh, perfect. Just straight down that road. I can't remember the name of the road, but straight down it. And and I guess those all those roads which are usually so congested around there are completely empty at the minute, or is the traffic building back up? Um, slowly, but not much. Not much at the moment, no. So how are you coping with lockdown? Has it been kind to you? Are you getting your work done? 
yes, getting the work done and, uh, well, yeah, it's going all right. I mean, I miss a little bit the interaction. I am a very sociable person, so, but you know, you've got to do what you've got to do. And that beautiful building, um, the new headquarters of the Square Kilometre Array, which has kind of just been designed with light and views of the dish at Jodrell Bank in mind, is such a, a smooth place to work, isn't it? Mm, yeah, it was a shame. I really like my office. We did, uh, so the original building was built five or six years ago, but then uh, we enlarged it and we refurbished it because the collaboration was much bigger. And so we were now in this sleek new part of it. And I really liked my office. And when they said that they were going to close, I was a little bit sad. And I wrote a message on the whiteboard. Anna was here with the date and hoping to go back soon. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, my gosh. OK, so then um, it's really nice for you to join us this evening. Now, we had, where was I, Macclesfield Astronomy um, probably about a year ago and Mattia Isidro came and did a, a talk to us about the Square Kilometre Array and it was pretty much the first I had heard about it and as far as enthralling lectures go, the amount of data, the construction that's involved and what it hopes to achieve just immediately made me fall in love with it. So talk a little bit about the overview because there are going to be lots of people watching tonight who don't really know much about the SKA, so big it up. <laughs> All right. So, well, the um, Square Kilometre Array, uh, or SKA, will be the largest radio telescope in the world when built. Um, radio, radio telescope means it's going to look at uh, the long wavelength of light, meters to centimeters in this case. And uh, the way that they are built now um, is uh, you basically build lots of dishes and you connect them together. And this is because uh, if you've got uh, long wavelength light, you need a bigger telescope. The, the longer the wavelength, the bigger the telescope. So the, um, the dish in Jodrell Bank is roughly the biggest that you can build as a single, because otherwise it's going to be too heavy, it's going to collapse, it's not going to be able to move. So what they figured is that if you build several twin antennas smaller than the Jodr, they could be just 10 meters instead of 70, but you connect them together, it is like uh, the single eye of, um, of a fly. You know, the flies have these composite eyes, a lot of eyes that together build a bigger eye. It's something like that, you know? Um, so, so we are gonna build two instruments in uh, South Africa and in Australia in the desert and connect them together. One of those around 200 dishes and another one several thousand on small um, antennas that look like television antennas. Um, and yeah, as I said, when build is going to be the largest, the biggest of uh, its kind. Uh, we are going to start construction next year after a design of several years. Uh, to which I contributed to in part. So it's very exciting now to switch in this phase of building it. And we are already seeing uh, interesting prospects because there are some other telescopes currently operating that we call pathfinders or uh, precursors like Meerkat, ASCAP that are in the same locations where we will build the SKA. Same concept even although a bit smaller in number, and they're already doing amazing and see exceptional things, much more details, unexpected things. So we are, we are confident when finished is going to give us a lot of satisfaction, this, uh, this instrument. So what kind of things are they going to be looking for then, Anna? Uh, it's going to be very, very versatile, actually. Uh, so the things that you... Ooh. Who turned out the lights? <laughs> apparently went to sleep my desktop and gonna keep it awake sorry about that i was saying it's gonna be extremely versatile so you can see in a very detail um very small things so looking at for example planets in extrasolar systems and the far as far as looking whether there are um organic molecules and possibly hints of life and even intelligent life going to larger things like studying galaxies in various phases of their evolution, how the galaxy form and evolve, and uh, looking at 
big samples of galaxies to study cosmology. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so from the very large to the very small, to very um, energetic processes, like, you know, uh, explosions, uh, uh, black holes accreting mass, with this active galactic nuclei. So it's going to be an observatory, basically. So not one single target, but several, several science cases. Wow. Now, one of the things that really impressed me was how much data this thing is going to generate. Do you, it was a, I remember a gasp going up from the audience when we found out how much it was going to generate and then finding out that that was only a fraction of what it was going to be when the full thing was online. So do you have any figures for that? Uh, yes. So um, uh, it depends in which stages, but basically the sheer number of data from all the single antenna, it's, it's huge. It's petabytes and petabytes streaming continuously. And those we can sort of reduce a little bit when we form images. Um, and these images are the things that we need to store for a long time. But still, it is an enormous logistical problem. Um, it is so much the data that we are not able to store it um, for a long time. So we need to process it immediately as, as soon as it comes in to form the images immediately because the raw data is, is just too big, right? Um, and then even when we form the images, we need to regularly begin shipping them, taking them out of the computers that will be near the site and go into these regional centers that are going to process them further. Um, so yes, it is, a, it is a great challenge and um, it's, it's nothing that we ever faced at the moment. All the um, operating radio telescopes, uh, they have the possibility to store their raw data for a little while. Um, while we have basically to process in, in real time, and this is a, this is cause for a lot of anxiety in the astronomers, because if you, what if you get something wrong, you cannot go back, right? Mm -hmm. So it's gonna, it's gonna need a lot of careful checks when we start operating, when we, we call it commission the telescope, uh, the data rate is not gonna be immediately full because we will have less antennas. So we need to really practice how to do this real-time processing to make sure, because the moment that you do it, you cannot go back. And if you make a mistake, you're going to lose some of the data. So yeah, so that, that is one of the biggest challenges. Okay. But you know, we are, we are confident, we are working on it. That's fantastic. OK, now that was an overview. We're about to go down the wormhole now. The, 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 the lecture is about to accelerate at light speed or even faster. So we're going to go down the wormhole. What are some of the latest findings in cosmology? And please feel free to be as technical as you want with this question. <laughs> All right. Well, actually, cosmology is, um, is a discipline of uh, very patient collections of a lot of clues, to be honest. So it's like if you have... Um, um, if you want to understand the humanity, you want uh, a lot of samples of a lot of people and what they do, and you try to get clues from that. Um, so we had uh, a gold mine um, for cosmology with the, the study of the CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background, that gave us, a, you know, what we believe it is a good model of the universe. And uh, we are now, um, we almost exhausted that gold mine, but there is a lot more that we can do. Instead of looking at this uh, ancient universe, the CMB is just a snapshot of the universe soon after the Big Bang, we can also look closer at the galaxies and the cluster of galaxies nearby. And so this is a more local universe and a more um, evolved universe, like close to how it is today. Mm -hmm. And what we can do is uh, basically see if this uh, other observations, they agree with the main picture that the CMB gave us. And um, this, uh, all these other observations, we are doing them now, but uh, we, we are going to have a, a breakthrough soon with the, some experiments that are coming up. One of them is Euclid that is going to launch in a couple of years. And also there are all these very big surveys and the SKA will also contribute to that in the radio, doing a lot, studying a lot of galaxies and putting them together. What we are seeing right now is that we have a little bit of a puzzle in our hands in that uh, the picture emerging from this um, 
other observations, they don't agree perfectly with the model that the CMB gave us. So this is potentially very interesting. It could tell us that we need to change some of, you know, it is challenging what we believe. Um, but we need more data to be conclusive. But if you want to do, you know, some example of something that did a big splash uh, um, recently, and it is not just cosmology, but it has implication, we can cite uh, um, the recent observation from the Horizon Telescope, the observation of the black hole. That was, was really cool, and it was uh, uh, 2019. A photograph so detailed that you can finally see the black hole, or better, the halo of light surrounding it. And uh, some years back, in 2015, there was the detection, first direct detection of gravitational waves. These two, we cannot attribute the merit to cosmology entirely, but these are very important for us. They are confirmation of um, general relativity and the theory of gravity. Um, and our models rely a lot on those. So, so it is very nice uh, to have those um, important discoveries as a confirmation that what, what we believe, it's, uh, at least it's, it is on solid foundations, let's say, because if uh, general relativity is challenged, then we have to rewrite a lot. <laughs> so oh. that would have been a bad, bad news. So we are very pleased with that. Nice one, Anna. Okay, very mind-expanding stuff. Um, now, cosmology is known for being odd. What, what kind of odd things have you discovered or what weird things are happening that you are that keeps you awake at night? <laughs> that keeps me awake at night? Uh, well, nothing really uh, awake at night. I, I would say maybe uh, there, are, uh, there is a measurement that we would really like to make. Uh, it is something that the SKA will also attempt. Um, this is trying to look at um, uh, a very young universe again. Um, so uh, the very cool thing about astronomy is that it is a time machine. So since the light from the object, they travel a speed of light, of course, um, the, most, the more distant the thing is, um, the earliest the light that you now see has started, right? So when you see something that is very distant, you see something that is very in the past. So this is, like a, this is like a time machine. So if you are able to zoom in with your telescope, and this is why we want to build bigger and bigger ones, because you are able to see these very distant and faint objects that tell you about the universe million and billion of years ago, right? So that is a cool thing. So there is a measurement that we would like to, to make, and it is, uh, um, it is done in the radio. Uh, it is called the Epoch of Orionization, is where, is where the first stars formed. And we believe we can measure that. It's extremely challenging because the other sort of, of radiation from our galaxy, from the other galaxies, is stronger. So you need to be able to clean it. But that would be a very, very nice movie of when the first stars emerge. So there has been a suggestion that maybe it has been detected um, by one experiment called Eagle, but other experiments couldn't confirm. So at the moment, there is a little bit of unrest on this measurement in particular, whether they've done it uh, or not. But several uh, experiments are trying to do the same measurement, and we hope we can nail it. It is also in the square kilometer array list as one of the most important things to do. So we, we hope it is proven that it is possible. Uh, if it's detected now, then we can, with the SKA, do it maybe even with more precision. It would be such a disappointment if this measurement resulted to be just too difficult to make. Oh, okay. Well, we wish you all the very best in that. Anna, could you please give us your how you got to be a cosmologist and some suggestions for a career path? All right. So, well... Um, I studied astronomy as I, as I was, you know, uh, as, as you said in your very nice introduction, thanks for that. And um, you do several exam courses. And initially, I was thinking I was interested in planets because it was the first, I don't know, everyone loves planets. But then when we did the, the cosmology, I got really fascinated. It is very abstract. It is applying math to reality. And you can be very imaginative with it. In the sense, is a lot about you know what we are, where we come from, things like that. Um, so yes, it's very fascinating. 
and um, I think it's a good path to be honest you need to be well you need to like big amounts of data and uh, an an analyzing data yes data analysis is, is something that you definitely need um, I don't know I guess be able to think out of the box and uh, be patient with cosmology you need a lot of patience because as you say it is collecting collecting a lot of clues uh, that individually tell you oh this is a very nice galaxy but uh, we want to basically use that to say what can it tell us about all the other ones you know so it's, it's a lot it's, it's a lot of detective work but it is a it is a good career path i would say yeah it sounds fantastic. Anna, you have been a wonderful guest. Thank you so much. Um, will you be working this weekend or will you be having some time off? <laughs> well, uh, I need to, there are a couple of things that I didn't manage to finish during the week. So I think I'll probably use part of tomorrow to catch up. But uh, yeah, then uh, after that, I think, I don't know, I'll uh, <laughs> lay well, in my garden if it doesn't. Hmm? I was going to say, enjoy relaxing this weekend and thank you and um, big Shout out to everybody at the SKA. Thank you very much for that, Anna. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. Great. Oh, my gosh. SKA, mind-boggling amounts of data. Where is my magnifying glass? Hang on. <laughs> when she was... Uh... When she was talking about being a detective, I was looking over at my magnifying glass and thinking, should I go and grab it now? <laughs> so, yeah, you need to be into large amounts of data, have the patience of a saint and um, and be very inquisitive to be a cosmologist. OK, we're nearly done now. We're going to be off air in about five or ten minutes. Let's see what the interactions are happening. Hello, everyone. Ah, it's Stephen Sargent dressed up as Tom Hanks. Um, <laughs> if anybody saw his Facebook this week. Hello, everyone. If you'd like to get involved in Square Kilometre Array Science, you might like this science project. I'm not going to read out the link, but click on it and you are going to get uh, involved in some Radio Galaxy Zoo. There you go. Thank you very much for that, Stephen. It's using one of the SKA Pathfinder projects Anna mentioned. It's Meerkat. <laughs> or the other one, uh, the one meerkat, the meerkat name sticks in my head. Okay, we're getting loads of interaction here this evening. Mark has said, where can we buy one of these fine SPA? Must not get SPA and SKA mixed up. It's been a bit of a brain medal for me tonight to try and figure it out. Um, popastro.com, then you'll see the shop tab recently stocked with new amusing mugs. Um, Alice says, if you are interested in the DIY radio telescope building, when the exact measure methods and measurements to build are one are ready, they'll be up here. OK. And of course, we will also tell you Mark is going to build a radio telescope. Um, thank you very much. So there we go. Well, this has been a lovely show this evening. What can we do the one about next week? I wonder. Usually it pops into my head on about a Wednesday what we can do. What have we got coming up in astronomy? Um, I suppose there's some Perseids. They're in July, though, aren't they? Um, what is coming up that we could do a special on? Feel free to suggest. Send us an email or drop a comment in here. And well done to who won the mug? Paul Harper won the mug. You might even get a picture of Lucy Green in the mug if you're very, very lucky. He guessed that Lucy Green was inside the mug. Okay, please like, tag, share this video. Uh, do consider joining the SPA. Like myself and Alice were mentioning about earlier, it helps you to connect with other astronomers. And so many of the people who've been commenting on this stream tonight I have met and they've become really good friends over the years. And it's just so nice to have people that you can dial up on your phone who's got the same hobbies and passions as you and just there for a chat. And of course, all the other benefits, the online meetings, the real meetings, the videos that we make, and of course, the magazine that comes out every two months, editor required. If you know any budding um, astronomy journalists, get in touch with Pop Astro because we're looking for an editor for this magazine. It's a voluntary role, but it will look blimmin amazing on your cv so um it's time for me to go now thank you very much to everybody who participated and contributed uh and we'll see you next week at the same time eight from eight until nine o'clock okay one more comment let's have a look 
Join the other week, finally. Yes, and MC join. Thank you. I hope you enjoy your magazine. And um, I did have a T-shirt on tonight, my new SPA T-shirt, but the banners were covering it and it just looked like I was wearing a white T-shirt. So I thought I'd go for the stripes. See you all later. Catch you later. Um, astronomy is looking up. I think that's what it says on one of the mugs. Bye.